Sunday, March 10th, I will be streaming my live reaction to the Oscars with my brother. Be there or be square. So, Oscar season is upon us, and I've decided I want to cover them all again. Well, not all of them, I did miss a few, but that's probably more than what most Academy voters can say. This is going to be a more casual discussion of these films. I'm not doing a deep dive like the Magnolia video, I am just here to give my thoughts. Considering there are so many films, this one is going to take a while. Some people like to eat while they watch videos. Well, you could probably cook your own meal while listening to this. Hell, you could probably buy the ingredients while this plays and still not have it finished by the end. Some of these films are great, some of these films are mid, and some of these films are straight up bad. So maybe that should pique your interest. I'm going to start with the films that have the most nominations to the least, and then we'll enter individual categories afterwards. So first up is Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan, with 14 nominations. This is a biopic about the guy who made the atom bomb. It explores his life and the complex relationship he had with his own creation. This film kind of made J. Robert Oppenheimer into a household historical figure, regardless of whether you even watched the film or not. Combined with Barbie, this was the movie event of the year. Although, I do want to say that I knew who he was before this movie, because I watched the Thanos vs. Oppenheimer rap battle. I was ahead of the curve. I had the privilege of watching this in 70mm IMAX, and yeah, it was pretty great all around. Killian Murphy is absolutely phenomenal as Oppenheimer, and his nomination is an absolute no-brainer. I really don't think there's a performance this year as ambitious as this one, and none of the other nominations even come close to what he's doing on screen. He's been a common collaborator with Nolan, mainly doing small supporting roles, so it's nice to see his first lead performance in one of his films be so well received. Robert Downey Jr. is also fantastic as Louis Strauss, which he received a nomination for. Turns out this guy can act outside of Marvel. He had me worried for a second. I was a little iffy on how the film integrated his side plot into the story, but he was very good within those scenes. He had a lot of memorable moments in the film, with my favorite one being his final scene. Emily Blunt also got a nomination for her portrayal as Katherine Oppenheimer. She is also great, although it is not my favorite performance of the year, but it is one of the better ones on this list. The film also got a nomination for Adapted Screenplay. When it comes to the screenplay nominations, I'm not sure if they're basing it off how well the screenplay is actually written, or how well the screenplay was adapted on the screen, because those are two very different things. Regardless, this is still a pretty good screenplay in both scenarios. Hoyt Van Hoytema got a nomination for the cinematography in this film. He's been working with Christopher Nolan since Interstellar, and yeah, I would say this is a deserved nomination. Those Nolan backshots are always iconic. Ellen Muirnick got nominated for costume design. Her previous films include Cloverfield, Jacob's Ladder, and G-Force. Biopics are usually a shoe-in for costume design, because it's easy to measure how good it is. You basically just measure how historically accurate the costumes are. I'm no expert on 1940s and 50s attire, but I thought it looked realistic. I also dressed up as Oppenheimer for Halloween, so that's gotta count for something, I think. The sound team was also nominated. A lot of them have also worked on previous Nolan films, and keeping in line with Nolan films, this one is the loudest of the bunch. When it comes to sound achievement, that's really all I noticed from this film. My bones were shaking from how loud some moments were. I understand this nomination, it will probably win, but I don't think it should personally. There's nothing particularly wrong with the sound, I just think there's a film that uses sound more creatively and uniquely than this one. And those are aspects I value more. Ludwig Göransson got a nomination for the score of this film. He was previously nominated and won for his score in Black Panther. I do like the score, it does fit the tone of the film very well, and it's interesting to see how they developed it behind the scenes. But there are certain points where I feel like the score is doing most of the emotional heavy lifting. Like, I'm feeling the emotion of the score more so than the actual scene or sequence itself. I know there's a purpose behind why violins are the main instrument for the score, but it ends up making some of the pieces sound a little samey. It's fine for a nomination, but I don't think it should win. Louisa Abel, also a Nolan collaborator, got a nomination for makeup and hairstyling. Again, it's easy to measure if the makeup is good in a biopic since you just see how accurate it is to the real life people. 
Still, it's no easy feat, especially in a film like this where you have so many characters, but they pulled it off pretty well. Except for Matt Damon, he looked like himself the entire time. I would not be upset if this won, but again, there are other films that use makeup more creatively. There's also production design done by Ruth D. Jung, and set decoration by Claire Kaufman. Yeah, very well done, very realistic for the time period. I would not mind it winning, but it's not my favorite personally. Film editing by Jennifer Lame got a nomination. She has some pretty diverse work on stuff like Hereditary, Tenant, Marriage Story, and Black Panther 2. The film editing here is not bad, but I have my issues. Yes, I am in the camp of people who think that this film is just a little too long. And what I think it comes down to is the pacing. I talked about this in my last video, but the film Magnolia has pretty much the same runtime as this film, but I don't feel the runtime because of the great pacing. All the scenes are cut down to the perfect length of time. Each scene gives us enough information, but never overstays its welcome. And it maintains a consistent pace and style throughout the film. But very noticeably, the pacing and style here are very inconsistent. There are points in the film where the pacing is just really fast and we blaze through so much information that I kind of struggle to keep up. And at other points, it slows down to the pace of a regular movie, and the combination of these two styles are kind of jarring. And these shifts are particularly very noticeable since some sequences are filmed in different aspect ratios, and some of them are even in black and white. The film just needed more time in the oven. That said, it will most likely win because the editing is so noticeable. And after going through every filmmaking department, we've reached the Best Director nomination for Christopher Nolan. Here's what I'll say. Christopher Nolan made a great biopic. Every department did a solid job and made an enjoyable, engaging experience out of a story that is dark and complex. And with the momentum it has, I think Nolan may very well get the award, and the film may very well get Best Picture. But he does not have my vote. Listen, I enjoy a good, competent, well-presented story as much as anyone else. But I also deeply appreciate things like creativity, uniqueness, and experimentation. And the film has that for sure. There are two specific scenes that come to mind when I think about experimentation in this film. But at the end of the day, it still very much sticks to the biopic formula. Not a bad thing by any means, I still appreciate a lot of what this film is doing, I just prefer a different type of film, which funnily enough, we are about to talk about. But yeah, overall, Oppenheimer gets a 7 out of 10 for me. Poor Things is the latest film from director Yorgos Lanthimos with 11 nominations. This film is about a woman who is brought back to life by a surgeon by putting a baby's brain into her head. I know, very cool. The film then follows her as she rapidly mentally matures and tries to understand the chaotic and dark world she lives in. It is very fun, very ambitious, and also very explicit. I guess people weren't aware of this before seeing the film, but there are a few scenes that have some blood, and there are quite a few scenes that have sex. I mention this because I saw this in a packed theater next to an old couple, and the lady was full on covering her eyes with her arms anytime this stuff came on screen. I don't know if either of them knew what they got themselves into, but it was very funny. There are a lot of things I like about this film, and we can get into that by looking at the categories. Emma Stone has a nomination for Best Actress in a Leading Role. Her performance was fantastic, especially for a role that's so bold, and for some might be controversial. You know, a child's brain inside a woman, and she has sex, Kind of taboo to say the least. While there is some valid criticism you can make about this, a lot of the discussion you'll find online comes from people who either haven't seen the film or are choosing to not engage with the film fairly. Because the film is very much not promoting this. The character she has sex with is not a good person at all. There is commentary here being made about men and exploitation that I think a lot of Twitter warriors are choosing to ignore. But I guess it's not like anyone goes to Grace Randolph for riveting film criticism. But yeah, the reason why I'm so impressed by the performance is because of how much Emma Stone has to do. She has to play multiple different mental ages, each with different patterns of speech. She has to act in very bold but purposeful sex scenes. She conveys a lot of different emotions during different stages of mental age. And she does it all while still being very funny. 
She's such a fun and interesting character to watch grow and change. Now that I think about it, her character is actually very similar to Barbie in the whole fish out of water, learning to understand the world around you type thing. But this is a much better movie in my opinion. Her nomination is very much deserved, and I really think she should win even though there is a clear fan favorite, which definitely is not her. Mark Ruffalo got a nomination for supporting actor, and yeah, his character was great. I mean, not a great person, but his character's personality and outlook on life is very contradictory, but also complementary to Emma Stone's character, and they work great together. Mark Ruffalo, I think, has been a very underrated actor for a long time, so it's also nice to see him get some recognition outside the MCU. All these actors are escaping their Marvel history as the ship slowly sinks. Iron Man will most likely win, but I would not be upset if the Hulk got it. Robbie Ryan has a nomination for cinematography. He also worked with Lanthimos in his previous film The Favorite, which I highly recommend. A lot of great shots in this one, a lot of unique stuff. You got the iconic Lanthimos fisheye lens, which I think started with The Favorite, which is also the first film he worked with Robbie Ryan, so maybe it's actually the iconic Robbie Ryan fisheye lens. Reading up a bit on the cinematography of the film, apparently there was a lot of experimentation with the lenses. There's also some creative stuff with the lighting going on, making the colors really stand out in this very weird and quirky film. It's creative, it's unique, I love it. I think it should get the Oscar here. Tony McNamara, another Lanthimos collaborator, got a nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay, with this film being adapted from a book of the same name. This one is a bit iffy for me. Again, I'm not sure what we're measuring here. Are we judging this by how good of an adaptation of the source material it is, or how good it is on its own? Personally, I think it's really good. But after doing some research, I've seen a common complaint being how some aspects from the book are changed for the worse here. For instance, the idea of consent is explored more heavily in the book, but almost entirely omitted from the film. Changes are always needed when translating to film, and the film still works regardless, but I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear from people who have read the book, and can comment on if it's a good adaptation or not. On its own though, I think it's pretty solid. I would like to see it win. Then we have costume design by Holly Waddington, which is very cool. She takes a mix of Victorian era styles and mixes it with these strange surrealist designs, and they end up looking great, with some symbolism behind the designs. Yeah, give her the award. Yorgos Mavroseridis got nominated for film editing. Sure, the pacing was great, never a dull moment. I'm sure it was not easy sorting through all the footage of Emma Stone getting back shots, but he made it work, and I think he deserves an award for that. The makeup and hairstyling crew got a nomination. This category really goes hand in hand with costumes. Both departments complement each other, and yeah, it was great here too. I mean, just look at Willem Dafoe. Give them an award just for this. Jerskin Fendricks got a nomination for the score. He is an experimental musician with a style that actually works perfectly for this film. The score isn't a bop or anything, although there are a few songs that I do consider bangers, but what it's doing first and foremost is setting the tone and atmosphere of the film. Certain tracks, like Bella, are strange and experimental because the film itself is exactly that. But as the character Bella starts to mature and grow as a character, the track develops into something more coherent and melodic. There is purpose behind the music, not just to convey certain emotions, but to also emphasize the themes, ideas, and just the general essence of the film. Easy win in my book. We also have a nomination for production design. Sure, a lot of great unique environments, I think it should win. So yeah, I have high praise for each department, which of course is all glued together with the direction of Yorgos Lanthimos. He should definitely win Best Director in my opinion. And I personally would like to see it win Best Picture, but that's not happening. But yeah, fantastic film, 8 out of 10. Probably going to be a 9 on a rewatch. Next film. Killers of the Flower Moon is the new Martin Scorsese film with 10 nominations. This is a movie about the Osage murders that took place in Oklahoma during the 1920s. It's pretty good, though not my favorite Scorsese film by a long shot. It is a very well presented film, but at three and a half hours runtime, it is way too long. I agree with the nomination for Lily Gladstone. I'm just not sure why she's in the lead actress category. 
is the difference between lead and supporting based on the amount of screen time an actor has or how important their character is to the story. Because Robert De Niro got nominated for supporting actor despite having only 9 minutes less screen time than her. If it's based on importance, then sure, I can see someone make that argument for her being lead, but I just don't see it. Don't get me wrong though, her performance is great, and if she was in competition for supporting actress, it'd be a cakewalk. However, she's in the lead actress category, and if I'm being honest, she's fighting an uphill battle. I am rooting for her, I just don't see it happening. But I'll be happy to be proven wrong. Robert De Niro got a nomination for supporting actor, and yeah, he's good, but not as good as the Marvel boys. Sorry Robert, maybe you should have tried the MCU first like the other Robert. Maybe it could have been Mephesto or something, I don't know. Rodrigo Prieto was nominated for his cinematography. He's worked on other Scorsese films, as well as the Barbie movie. So anyone mad that Barbie didn't get a cinematography nom? Uh, here he is. It would have gone to the same guy. And yeah, he did a good job. There are moments like the opening where his work really shines through. There's also a lot of great blocking that I remember. Would not be mad if it won, but the other films I talked about will probably get it. Jacqueline West got a nomination for costume design. She's worked on films like The Revenant and both Dune films. From what I can tell, it was accurate to the time period. I guess this film gets more points than Oppenheimer for the fact that they had to integrate different clothing styles of the time period. You know, on top of the Western style clothing, you also have to recreate Native American styles and tribe specific attires. So that's impressive. I think between the biopic costume nominations, I would prefer this one. Thelma Schoenmacher got a nom for editing. Just like with Oppenheimer, I think this needs more time in the editing room. I think I had a better time overall with the pacing here, but by the end I felt the runtime for sure. I am just now noticing that I have criticized the editing of the only films where women are the editors. Uh, my bad women. Robbie Robertson got a nomination for score. He's a Canadian musician who frequently works on the music for Scorsese films. Similar thoughts to the Oppenheimer score, it's fine, it works for the film, but not really a standout score for me. The film also got a nomination for Best Original Song for A Song For My People, a very purposeful song for the film. I'm glad it got a nomination, and I can see it winning. There was also a nomination for Production Design. The sets looked very authentic and really captured the time period. I would not mind if it won. Genuinely surprised that the film did not get an Adapted Screenplay nomination. It walks circles around Barbie and American fiction, but we'll get there when we get there. Finally, Martin Scorsese is nominated for Best Director. I love Martin Scorsese. He is one of the goats of cinema. I'd love to give him the award just for being him, you know? But I'm gonna be honest, he's the weakest nomination here. He made a good movie. I just think the other films here had more sauce to it. As for Best Picture, it does have a small chance of winning. I would not be mad if it won. Next up, we have Barbie, directed by Greta Gerwig, with eight nominations. Oh boy, do I have some opinions. A lot of people were upset that Margot Robbie did not get a lead actress nomination, and people were getting really weird about it too, to the point of kind of discrediting the achievements of other actresses. Oh no, the indigenous woman got a nomination over the white woman. Boo-hoo. If only she played the role of a survivor of mass murder. A role that requires a lot more emotional effort, and is also very historically important for the culture of a historically marginalized people. If only she did that! Fucking cry me a river. Did we really need to call in war criminal Barbie to defend the billion dollar movie? It must suck to be America Ferreira, I think the only person of color from the film to get a nomination, and for no one to really care. Not even Reddit guy Simu Liu bothered to mention you in his post. Fucking brutal. On that note, did we really need to ask Michelle Yao why she thought the white woman was robbed of her chance at an Oscar? Because they historically have had a hard time winning stuff, just like her, right? But also, I feel bad for Margot Robbie, who I'm pretty sure hasn't said anything about this. I don't think she's upset. Her career lives on. She also technically still has a nomination in the Best Picture category. Like, she can still get the Oscar if that's what everyone is upset about. Expecting a nomination for lead actress as Barbie was always kind of silly. It's a fun role with some emotional moments, 
but nothing outstanding. It's like if we gave Chris Evans an Oscar for playing Captain America. He's great at playing him, it's just not an outstanding role. If Barbie fans watched more than two movies a year, they'd understand that there were better, more complex performances this year. Some that weren't even nominated. Kaylee Spaney in Priscilla, Natalie Portman in May-December, and yes, I'm keeping this same energy for the other acting nominations too. America Ferreira does not deserve an acting nom when Julianne Moore is right there. Hell, give it to Sandra Huller again for the zone of interest. She was working overtime this year, she deserves it. Was she nominated just because of the woman's speech near the end? Cause I think enough time has passed for us to admit, that was kinda cringe. And that's not just my male opinion, this is a common sentiment among the women I know too. And let's not forget the boys. Ryan Gosling should not have been nominated. Charles Melton absolutely smokes this dude and is probably the only person actually in competition with Bob Jr. Jacob L. Lordy did a better job at portraying Elvis than Austin Butler, and he did it while having less screen time. Get the prosecutor guy from Anatomy of a Fall in there. Get the blind kid in there. Hell, get the dog in there! Maybe I'm in the minority opinion of this, but I don't care. I'd rather live standing than die kneeling. But the film is not bad, it did some things right. The costumes made by Jacqueline Duran were phenomenal. I wouldn't be surprised if it won, a nomination very much deserved. It's got two nominations for original song, personally not a fan of I'm Just Ken, but What Was I Made For is a certified banger, and I feel strongly that it should win. Production design is also great, however, I get the impression that a lot of people think every set was built by hand and practical, and I'm sure a lot of them were, but there were also a lot of special effects and green screen use. I wouldn't blame you for not knowing, since they literally tried to hide it in all the marketing. This scene was filmed on blue screen. There is a blue screen here, and you can see they've badly removed it and inserted the desert background to look like one of the production department's backdrops. Warner Brothers has done a complete blue screen removal on 45 minutes of bonus material because they'd rather do that than just talk about the tens of millions of dollars of great visual effects they used for the $1 billion box office success. Using special effects and green screens does not mean the production design is bad. The same amount of work goes into it whether it's practical or CGI. But the fact that they were trying to keep it a secret makes me not want to rally behind it. Poor things would never lie to me like that. This film also got adapted screenplay for Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach, not deserved at all. For one, you know, the women's speech existing, still very cringe. But two, Killers of the Flower Moon is right there. Priscilla is right there. Listen, I enjoy the Barbie movie. It's a fun movie, but aside from a few technical awards, I don't think it deserves all these nominations. And certainly not the ones fans are crying over. Greta Gerwig is a good director. She should have gotten a nom for Best Director in 2019. But this is a stacked year, and she simply does not make the cut. Especially when her film has probably one of the worst car chase scenes I've seen in a film in the last decade. It literally looks like a car commercial, because the guy who directed this segment directed car commercials. Yeah, it's not her fault, but she's still okay to this and kept it in the film. That's on her shoulders. If there is a noticeable flaw with the directing, you don't get the director nomination. It's simple math. And no, she could not direct the other films here either. Are you crazy? I do not want to see Greta Gerwig's The Zone of Interest. The movie is fun. The movie is fine. Let's calm down everyone. Overall, 6 out of 10. Up next is Maestro, directed by Bradley Cooper, with 7 nominations. This is a biopic about Leonard Bernstein and his complicated life and relationship with his wife Felicia. If you thought I was mean to Barbie, you are in for a treat. I don't think this movie is as terrible as everyone else on Twitter does, but it's not good either. It's just a really boring, standard Oscar bait film. When I watch a biopic, especially one that functions as a character study, I expect to come out with a deeper understanding of this person than before. With this film, I learned that 1. He was gay, although I learned that mainly from the announcement of the film. 2. 
he was kind of a piece of shit to his wife, and three, he really liked music and conducting. If you asked me why he liked music, I could not tell you. If you asked me why he was rude to his wife, I also could not tell you. Being a bit charitable here, I'm sure the film explored these things at some point, but it just didn't hold my attention long enough for me to even remotely care. Minor spoiler, I guess, dude spends the whole movie cheating on his wife. There's a point where they argue and she calls him evil, and then like 20 minutes later, during a concert, she just forgives him. And I sat there going, okay, sure, why not? I don't know why she chose to forgive him at such a random time. I'm sure the answer is somewhere in the dialogue, but dog, I just did not care. Bradley Cooper got a nomination for lead actor. No, no, I, I disagree actually, for a lot of reasons. After having seen the film, I decided to look up what the actual Leonard Bernstein sounded like, and holy crap, that is a completely different person. Bradley Cooper does this thing with his voice which I can only describe as doing a straight guy's interpretation of a gay accent with heavy vocal fry. Leonard Bernstein sounds like a fucking regular guy. What we're trying for is a very high overview of musical development in terms of a vocabulary constantly being enriched by more and more remote and chromatic overtones. Arthur Rajinsky was the musical director of the New York Philharmonic. <coughs> God told him to hire me. And my assignment turned out to be the Randall Thompson Second Symphony. All of it, not just a movement. Usually you had a movement or something because there's so many people in the class. Yes, a diminution of creativity which has come to a grinding halt. Mm. I mean, not scientifically, that has exploded. This is like Tom Hanks in Elvis levels of missing the mark. If you can't even get the superficial elements down, I don't think you deserve the nomination. At the very least, Carrie Mulligan gives a great performance. She really steals the show from Bradley Cooper, which is very funny. Matthew Libatique got a nomination for his cinematography. No, no. Uh, it's not bad cinematography, but to give this a nomination over the zone of interest, you actually have to be smoking crack. The film also got makeup and hairstyling. I'll give it up and say it's good, but still does not hold a candle to the other nominees I've talked about. It also got a sound nomination. Sure, go ahead. It, ironically, did not get a nomination for score, so I guess sound is the next best thing. Bradley Cooper and Josh Singer also got a nomination for Best Original Screenplay. No, and I got a good argument for this one. Back when it released, there was this tweet showing a video comparing a scene from the film to what was described in the screenplay. And in the screenplay, we get this super long paragraph describing in excessive detail the exact emotions the character of Leonard is supposed to be feeling in that moment. Now, I've only read a few screenplays in my life, but of the ones I've read, they don't describe emotion like this. Usually because it allows the potential actor to have some liberty in how they perform. But more importantly, if I have to read the screenplay to actually understand the exact emotional state of this character, then I don't think you've done a good job bringing this screenplay to life. Yeah, overall, not great. I can't see myself ever seeing this again. But you know, I don't hate Bradley Cooper after watching this. 4 out of 10. Alright, we gotta talk about a good film again. Anatomy of a Fall is directed by Justine Trier and has 5 nominations. This is a film about a murder trial where a writer, played by Sandra Huller, is trying to prove her innocence in her husband's death. I very much enjoyed this film. Coincidentally, I was already starting to get into these types of legal dramas, with films like 12 Angry Men and Anatomy of a Murder. So this film came out at just the right time for me. This film has a very engaging story, with various morally grey aspects that are ripe for interpretation and conversation. I really like that this film treats its audience like mature adults. A lesser film would have taken the audience's hand and led them to very obvious conclusions, but instead we're allowed to come to our own conclusions as the situation unfolds. We may be following the main character, but we still feel like an actual member of the public. And this is all tied together with great performances from Sandra Huller, to the kid, to even the dog. No, that's not an exaggeration, the dog is actually really good at acting. 
Sandra Huller has a nomination for her lead performance. I think she's great. She is a very close second to Emma Stone for me, and I would still be very happy if she won. Lorenz Senecal got a nomination for editing. He seems to be a frequent collaborator with Justine Treyer, so that's cool. There is a lot of cutting back and forth between events, especially during the trial, and the film presents that very well. Some people tend to say that's an achievement of the screenplay, but a big part of editing is deciding when exactly do we cut to these past events or to the next scene. You know, do we let the scene linger on a little longer after they stop talking, or do we cut immediately after they stop? You're essentially deciding the pace of the film with that. A film like Oppenheimer lost me with its mix of fast and slow editing, while this film was more consistent and I like that. Still giving it to poor things on this one, but Anatomy would not be a bad choice either. The film also got an original screenplay nomination for Justine Trier and Arthur Harari. Not only is this a well-written and complex screenplay, written in different languages too, but it also includes some pictures for us. Not just storyboards, mind you. There are pictures of the actual set they were going to film on. I thought it was pretty neat. Justine Trier herself got a directing nomination. Very much deserved. It seems she had a precise vision for the film, and she did a great job bringing it to life on screen. She also directed a dog to act really well. Only one other director can say that from this list, but her dog had more presence in the film. Lanthimo still has my vote, but seeing her win would also be great. As for Best Picture, it has a good chance in terms of its filmmaking qualities, but other films have more momentum or more clout. Still, I would not mind if it won. Solid 8 out of 10 on this one. Next, we have The Holdover, directed by Alexander Payne, with five nominations. This is a film about a strict boarding school teacher who has to chaperone a student with nowhere to go during Christmas break. Not only does this take place in the 70s, but it also adopts a lot of the aesthetics of a 70s film. From the color grading to the film grain and the music, it's all 70s inspired. And I actually like this film, surprising since I usually don't like these kind of slice of life films. I saw it around Christmas, the optimal time to watch it, and it was just a nice, funny, little comfortable film. Yes, it follows a lot of the same tropes that many indie films have, but it knows what it is and plays into it very well. I think these smaller budget, just plainly simple good films are important to our media diet. Like not everything has to be a six-figure blockbuster or even a complex art house film. Sometimes you just want an unchallenging little film about two unlikely people forming a friendship. It's not an all-time award winner, but it is good, wholesome fun. And then it went on to get a bunch of awards. This is where my opinion diverges from everyone else. People really love this film, going so far as to call it one of the masterpieces of this year. And I can't really agree. I like The Holdovers in the same way I like John Favreau's Elf. It's cute, it's funny, but it's not really a film I'm watching or remembering for any great cinematic qualities. Kevin Tent got a nomination for editing, and I can't really explain why. There is like one well-edited sequence where the editing actually adds to the humor. It's good, but that's like one sequence. The editing is not bad, it's just like, fine, it works. I don't think they'll win, but they can keep the nomination. The one I'm most perplexed by is the best original screenplay. Like I said, this is a film that is filled with cliches and tropes. The presentation, I'd say, is unique, at least for this year. But the actual content of the story, it's all very familiar. Also, they really shoehorn in these lines promoting Miller Lite beer for some reason. Felt really out of place for what this kind of film was. If it deserves any technical awards, I'd personally give it a cinematography nomination. It is very refreshing seeing a film have more creative blocking and cinematography compared to other bigger budget films. But no, I guess we have to give that award to Maestro. That said, the acting nominations are fine. Paul Giamatti was good in this role, but he's not even close to Killian Murphy. No one on this list is really. 
Divine Joy Randolph got an award for Supporting Actress. And you know what? It's well earned. I think it might be the best performance on this specific list of nominees. She has her own subplot in this film about coping with grief. Obviously this entails a lot of emotional moments, and she performs it very well. I'd say it's my favorite part of this movie. Surprisingly, Dominic Sessa did not get a Supporting Actor nomination. I wouldn't say it's a performance of the year, but he's really good for someone making their debut performance. And if we're already giving awards to the film, and if we're also giving one to the Ken performance, then throw Dominic Sessa a nom to. As for Best Picture, I don't see it winning, and if it did, I wouldn't be mad, but I would be a little bit disappointed. Yeah, overall good film. I liked it, but did not love it like everyone else. 7 out of 10. But you know, this won't be the only film where I don't agree with the majority opinion. Next up we have The Zone of Interest, directed by Jonathan Glazer, with five nominations. This film takes a contemplative look at the life of Nazi officer Rudolf Haas and his family as they live right next door to Auschwitz. The film essentially tries to answer the question of how a family can handle living so close to cruelty. How exactly does a family function after normalizing the violence happening right next door? Watching these family members go about their day with cold indifference is truly disturbing. And that is essentially the premise of the whole film. We're shown these mundane moments in their lives with the background knowledge of something truly evil going on around them. It's presented masterfully, and the imagery never becomes any less haunting as the film goes on. However, I can't say it worked effectively for me the whole way through. By the halfway point, I understood completely what this film was going for, and what it was trying to say, and then it kept doing the same thing for another hour. Mind you, there is a purpose behind why it's presented this way, and for many it works. The film is being called a masterpiece among many film circles. And on paper, this type of slow and methodical film should work for me too. I deeply appreciate all the filmmaking aspects here from the cinematography to the sound design to the performances, another great one by Sandra Huller this year. I wish I could see it as a masterpiece like everyone else, but I just don't. However, it does deserve all its nominations. Tarn Willers and Johnny Byrne got a nomination for sound, and I truly think they should win. The whole film revolves around the subtle hints of cruelty happening around the family, and that includes things like the sounds of the camps in the background, especially during those nighttime scenes. The film also has a nomination for adapted screenplay, and I can definitely see it winning that. It also got a nomination for Best International Film. It's also the only international film that is also nominated for Best Picture, so take a guess who is going to win. It does deserve the win though, no denying that. Jonathan Glazer also has a nomination for Director. Yeah, like I said, the filmmaking aspects are all great, and that's all possible from great directing. I can definitely see him winning. Even if the film is not my favorite, I can still appreciate what it's going for, and I would not mind if it won Best Picture. Overall, at least for me, 7 out of 10. Next up we have American Fiction, directed by Cord Jefferson, with 5 nominations. It follows a frustrated novelist professor who writes an outlandish satire of stereotypical black books, only for it to be mistaken by the liberal elite for serious literature and published to both high sales and critical praise. Yes, that is the Wikipedia plot summary, cause I'm sorry, I could not care less about this film. Let me get one thing straight, I agree with pretty much everything this film says. You know, wanting representation of the black experience to be more than just stereotypical crowd-pleasing stories of the ghetto as the film puts it. Yeah, I can totally understand that. You know, there is a conversation to be had about white audiences only being receptive to certain types of stories from minorities and how it limits writers from being able to venture outside those stereotypes. However, the movie itself is just boring as shit. I kid you not, this whole movie feels like a darn man skit. Right from the opening scene, we have the grouchy professor talking down to the blue-haired liberal white girl who is too offended by the n-word. 
He tells her to get over it, and then he instantly regrets it. Every line of dialogue is the most unnatural, unrealistic shit you'll ever hear. This one conference at the beginning has the worst, most obvious, forced exposition I've heard in a while. Again, Darman levels of complexity here. Listen, a scathing satire on the writing industry could be very fun and engaging, but the film also tries to insert this half-baked family drama that I really don't think adds anything to the film, really. It follows the exact same formula and cliches as other indie slice-of-life films. And I just don't care. I'm well aware it may sound like I'm doing the exact same thing this film is criticizing, in that I'm not letting a black story be something more than my preconceived notion of what a black story is. But no, I'd have the same exact complaints if the story was about any other race. Keep in mind, I famously don't like these type of slice-of-life indie dramas. The Holdovers is an exception because I like the style and presentation. Perfect Days, which I'll talk about later, is an exception because I like the style and presentation. This film has no style, no creative presentation, and the satire simply does not go anywhere interesting. If you're looking for a film that actually does these things, well, I suggest you watch Sorry to Bother You. A very underrated film from 2018 with social commentary that is way more interesting than anything American fiction has to offer. Anyways, this film got nominations for acting, Jeffrey Wright as lead, and Sterling K. Brown for supporting. I don't agree. I think it was pretty bad. Although that's more the fault of the shitty script and the direction they were given, because Jeffrey Wright is a good actor in other films. You can only do so much when you're given nothing. The film also got a nomination for score, which is fucking embarrassing. The score is the most cliche, four-star restaurant type background music I've heard in a film. On Spotify, there is a trend of fake jazz playlists being made by Spotify themselves. Just a ton of low-effort slop made by fake artists that people are supposed to play in the background of a store and forget about it. And the American Fiction soundtrack would sound right at home here. I'm not kidding. This also got adapted screenplay, which I think there's a typo on the Oscars page. It says written by Cord Jefferson, when it should really say written by Darman. This thing beat out Killers of the Flower Moon, Priscilla, Society of the Snow, and literally anything else. I'd genuinely put Godzilla minus one over this. And surprise, surprise, I do not think this should win Best Picture. Four out of ten. Moving on. And the last of the Best Picture nominees, we have Past Lives, directed by Celine Song, with two nominations. This is a film about two childhood friends from Korea who grow apart as life takes them in different directions, both in a physical way and emotional way. This is a very sweet and touching story about love that just never manifested. I really appreciate how the film tackles this subject with a level of maturity and realism. Other films of this nature would have the guy try to find a way to win her back, or have a scene where she decides which man is right for her. But that's just movie magic. That simply never happens. It's just wishful thinking. Instead, we get to see how the nature of this friendship and relationship affects everyone in the story. This is just life put bare on the screen, and I deeply appreciate that. The film is able to explore this topic so well, because it's a topic that Saline Song herself is deeply familiar with, as the story is inspired by her own experience. This is nominated for Best Original Screenplay, and I would love for it to win. It takes a lot of bravery and skill to make great art this personal, and I think it should be rewarded. I'll also say the performances were also great. I wouldn't mind if either of these two got a nomination, but it was a pretty stacked year. The film most likely won't win Best Picture, but I'd still be happy if it did. A good solid 8 out of 10. Hey everybody, Zelcher here. Uh, I really hate to do this, but I'm gonna cut it off right there. I did watch the other categories, but looking at my timeline right now, I still have like 
an hour of footage left to edit. And if I did that, this video will just knock it out in time. And if we're being so honest and so real with ourselves, most people really just care about the Best Picture nominees. So I'm going to focus on uploading that first. I'm still going to upload part two soon, like in a week or two, but I just need this part out as soon as possible. Hope you guys understand, there is no one more sad about this than I am. Anyways, hope you enjoyed this video, shout out to the patrons as per usual, and I hope to see you in the next video. And I hope to see you in the next video.